Have you been avoiding the doctor's office? Today, Dr. Oz wants you to change that. He knows it could save your life. Viewer interventions will be next. Dr. Mehmet Oz is here. Did you know as many as 90 million Americans may be ignoring potential medical problems simply because they are scared? They are very scared <laughs> to go to the doctor. Today, America's doctor helps some of our viewers face their deepest fears so they can start to take control of your health and your lives. And once and for all, you're here to tell them. The reality is there's so many things we can do today. Yeah. They can prevent all the hardships down the road. And th today, we're going to talk about emotional barriers to getting tested, people who don't realize how important it can be for them, and a lot of the stereotypes and myths that hold us back from doing what's right to our own bodies. OK, Dr. Oz didn't have to look very far for our first intervention, because it all started when Chicago firefighter Nate Irvin stood up in our audience a few weeks ago when there was an audience of all men. I thought that was very interesting, all the penis conversation <laughs> uh, going on. Well, they stopped for a minute talking about the peni to have this question. I had a question about uh, colon cancer. I had a brother, he passed away at 35. I'm sorry. From that, and uh, I'm 35 right now. You know? Well, what did your colonoscopy show? Well, I, I have uh, <laughs> I'm not even gonna answer that right. question unless you get a promise to get a colonoscopy. Right. You promise? Yeah. Promise? Promise. Done. You're on national television, you say you're getting one. Yeah, right. I'm getting one. Am I nervous? Uh, no, not really. I think about my brother, so it's more of a reason for me to do it. This picture here. It's uh, me and my brother, he motivated me to keep going and never give up. This picture just shows the unity between me and him. So this one here is going to New York with me. I'm on the plane right now. We're on our way to New York. This is noise. The purpose of this is to cleanse my system, uh, to prep me for tomorrow for the uh, colonoscopy. Let me show you my best friend right quick. This is gonna be my best friend for the night. <laughs> I gotta drink one eight ounce cup every 10 minutes, so here we go. I'll let you know how it is. It's not bad. I can do that. All right, it's my second cup. Just waiting on the effects. <laughs> Halfway through. I think I'm about to go. I'm feeling it. A little, um, sensation. How you doing, Dr. Oz? How you doing? Well, is it as much fun as you thought it would be? Oh, no, it's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's good, just up here trying to drink down this, uh, tri-light. You, you talk to 100 people who have colonoscopies, mm -hmm. 99 will say that fluid was the hardest part. Well, yeah. listen, I'm very proud of you for following through. I'm, I'm proud of you for being brave enough to, to be an example to all of America, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the morning. <laughs> all right, Nate, buddy, I'll see you tomorrow. All right, you have a good night. Take care. All all right. Right. Well, it wasn't so bad, right? No, it wasn't bad. OK, so the next day, Nate was all cleaned out. Yeah. Yes, and ready for the big moment. With his family history of colon cancer, doctors said there was a 50-50 chance of finding something troubling in Nate's exam. Let's see what's up. Hey, hey Tiger, how are you? How's it going? Good, good to see you. <laughs> so how'd it go? Uh, it went well. I know that you got a lot of anxiety going into this. I would, too. Uh, but you ought to see this as any kind of athletic event in your life, any kind of major process you have, that you have to get ready for emotionally and physically. It's the same kind of thing. <laughs> All right? Yeah, sir. Let's head out. Come on. All right. And we're off. Nate? Dr. LaPook. John LaPook. John, how you doing? How's everything? Welcome to New York. Thank you. Thank you. So you worried about this procedure at all? And I don't really don't know what to expect because mm -hmm. I never had it done. And 
And we're doing it at 35 in your case, which is younger than we would normally do it because your brother had colon cancer at 33 or 34. And we know that colon cancer starts off as a benign polyp that's sitting there for 5, 10, 15 years. And if at any time in that 5, 10, 15 years we go in there and pluck it out, you don't get colon cancer instead of getting colon cancer. It's a no-brainer, right? <laughs> okay, let's get going. Either way, pressure. Come over here. So what's the likelihood? You know, he's, uh, I think, appropriately nervous. When he brought it up at the beginning, he was uh, asking about his brother, but at the end of the day, it's about him, too. Whatever it is, I'd rather he not have a polyp, but if he has a polyp, how great that he came in here and we're able to catch it now. I'm ready. Waiting on the doctor to come in. Trying to pump myself up. This is a colonoscope, and I have to tell you, this is a technological tour de force. It's amazing. This is how you drive the thing, right, with these little knobs. You can go up, right? You can go to the right. You can go to the left. So, Nate, this is a little bit leap of faith time, right? Yeah. You're going to just trust us, and we're going we're gonna to work as hard as we can. We're going to do this as safely as possible. And tell me all about it when I wake up, right? Yeah, we'll tell you all about it. <laughs> I'll see you after the colonoscopy, OK? OK, this is some oxygen. I'm just going to put this in your nose. That's exactly what's going on here, so. You OK, Tiger? He's pretty sleepy now. Uh, yeah, it's good. Okay. I think it's a good time to... Uh, All right, I'll get going. All right. We are in. You see the, the fold of the colon. Again, very normal looking so far. You see the veins, Mehmet? Yeah. They're beautiful, yeah. aren't they? They're spectacular. So right now, I've popped into the small intestine. If you saw that in the colon, you'd say that's a polyp, right? Yeah. In the small intestine, that's just part of your immune system. They're called Peyer's patches. That's normal, so we don't... We don't biopsy that. Now, on the way back, turns out you have to really take your time. These things, polyps can hide. Mehmet, every one of these pieces of little debris, uh -huh. you can have a polyp under there, like that. That could have been a polyp, but it washed away. This is textbooks, Mehmet. This is just a normal looking colon, beautiful looking folds, normal blood vessels. Getting towards the end, you, just, you can tell. Yep. We have our foot left. We got about a foot left here, about right. Um, hold on. Uh, there is a slight bump over here. Remember, you see that? I'm going to take that. That's a tiny polyp. So here's the instrument. When you have a fold, this is a perfect example. See how I didn't see it? Now I see it. Close. Now you see it, now you don't. Bullseye. There's another one right here. Let's get it. Do you, you take them out all the time? Absolutely. I'm not rolling the dice. No way. Okay, uh, oh, there's one. There's one. See it there on the left? I'm getting good at these polyps now. And that we're going to call Mehmet's polyp. Close. Thank you. And bullseye again. So there were six tiny little polyps, right? Should be pretty quick. Nate? There you go. Eight tigers. Well done. You relax. No polyps. You had tiny, tiny, tiny little polyps that I plucked out. I was there. I plucked them out. We never roll the dice in medicine, so we'll see what the pathologist says. Wow, OK. Thank you for letting us share that. I mean, yeah. that is. <laughs> anytime. Anytime. <laughs> Dr. LaPook is here. What did the uh, pathologist uh, find or say about those little polyps? Well, there's really great news here today. And uh, for three reasons. One, as I've already told Nate, the polyps were totally benign. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. <laughs> Two, they were the kind that are not at risk to develop into cancer over time. So that's good. And then three, when Katie Couric had her on-air colonoscopy, yeah. she inspired a 20% increase in the number of screening colonoscopies that other people got. Nate, I fully expect that today we are all seeing the birth of the Nate Urban effect. <laughs> <laughs> because that was called the Katie Couric effect, the Couric effect. Wow. Thank you, Nate. That was fantastic. Don't you feel better? I feel great. Isn't it a burden off of you now? Yeah, because I was, I was going to get it done, but I was prolonging it. Yeah. yeah. Now, when will he have to get it done again, since there's a history of it in his family? Right. You know, this is a little bit of clinical judgment here, because he has this family history of having colon cancer in a brother at early, an early age. And there are certain types of cancers that are really highly genetic and mm -hmm. make him predisposed to having cancer at an earlier age. He also has a grandfather who had colon cancer. So we're going we're gonna to repeat this colonoscopy in three years. Okay. Now, one other factor is... Normally, it's 10? 
Well, it's tan if it's normal, but if you look at Nate carefully, notice he's dark skinned? Yeah. <laughs> That's a big deal. Afri well, African Americans get colon cancer earlier. Really? It's more aggressive when they get it. Really? Which means they die more often from it. So we don't want to miss it. And Dr. Lapooks noticed uh, that, that there are some of these uh, cancers that have genetic elements to them. And he's uh -huh. brought that to all of our attention. So genetic counseling is going to be a big part of your future. And if, in fact, it turns out that your brother's cancer was a genetic one, we want to be that much more aggressive. But normally it's 10 years if you're completely clean. OK. So in three years, he goes back. So how long does it take a polyp to grow? Well, he here's the great thing. And this is the really, really the reason why it's so great to do screening. If the day after your colonoscopy, say, a next polyp started to grow, it would be 10, 15 years before that polyp turned into cancer. So if at any point in that time you pluck the polyp out, you don't get cancer instead of getting cancer if that was the kind of polyp that was yeah. going to become a cancer. OK, Nate, to explain to people, really, you don't feel a thing. I mean, you're out there. We're poking around in your colon. <laughs> the whole world's looking at it. All up in me. Yeah, well, it, was, it, was, um, <laughs> it was, I didn't feel anything. It was simple. It was easy. All right. You heard it, America. It was easy. Dr. Oz brought some video to show us what colon cancer looks like. Fortunately, you didn't have it, so this is what you do not want to see during your colonoscopy. So, so this is the colonoscopy. Again, the same kind of things we saw in Nate. And you're coming back through the colon, and it looks just as clean as Nate's did. Get healthy person, no symptoms, and boom, what's this? What's that right there? Polyp. Polyp. Now, that's a big polyp. <laughs> Well, actually, that's only about the size of a lima bean. I know, but compared to the little teeny tiny polyps that Dr. Uh, Lapook took out, that, that, looks, that looks big. It, it is much larger. It's different kind of polyps, by the way. Some polyps okay. are more likely to get bigger than others. These kinds of polyps are the ones we worry about. And when you get just an elective, routine, normal colonoscopy, 15 to 20 percent of the time, ones like this become apparent. Often they're smaller, sometimes they're larger. Wow. Now, here's what we do. When you get a polyp like this, the key thing you want to wonder in your mind is, did this polyp invade through that wall? The tube of the colon gets invaded by the cancer. Once it goes in there, it spreads out, goes to the liver and everywhere else. Got it. So doctors like Dr. Lapook put a little snare around this and can take that out. And then you can examine it and figure out if, in fact, you've gotten it all out. And if you have, you've cured yourself. Wow. Which is really the big news today. What we're going to talk about today are the biggest cancers that take our lives. And of all of them, this is probably the example, colon cancer, where we can save the most lives, because you truly cure people just by finding it. OK. Thank you again, Nate. We're happy for you and your diagnosis. Coming up, 28 million Americans admit they do this, a medical intervention for a woman who says she is addicted to this. Back in a moment. <laughs> it's Medical Intervention Day with Dr. Oz. Nate just, uh, Nate Irwin just let us go all the way, all up inside him for the, uh... <laughs> yeah, but no, don't you feel better about getting one? Yeah, yeah. I, I've had one, and I, I, I loved the sleeping part. That was great. Honestly, did, did it bother you to have it? Not, not one bit. I mean, really, after I had it, I couldn't understand why is everybody making such a big deal about it. But they, they make a big deal about it because they don't think it can affect them. Really? Right. They, they think it's a male disease. Yeah. Right. Not true. Forty percent or more are, are women, so it's just about almost 50-50. They think it's for old people. <laughs> Ten percent of people get colon cancers are younger than the age of 50. Nate's brother's a good example of that. They think it has to be a family history deal. It's not. 70% of people get colon cancer don't have a family history. And they think, and this is the biggest issue, and I think the big message on the whole, the whole show is that if you find it, most people think, well, now I'm, you know, I'm really cooked. Not true. In colon cancer, if you find it 95% of the time, you can cure it. Wow, just by plucking it out. Exactly. So okay. why wouldn't you do it? By get, and the earlier, the better. Once it's, it's penetrated that wall you showed us, exactly. that's when it's too late. And it's warning you. It's giving you a decade to come in there and peek. Yeah. It said, yeah, I gave you 10 years. What do you want? <laughs> All right, Peggy from Tacoma, Washington, sent an email that got our attention. Take a look at what Dr. Oz calls a big old red flag. I just, I've always liked the feeling of whether it is a tanning booth or out in the real sun. I just, I've always enjoyed the heat, the warmth. Just always makes me feel better. I've been tanning in the booth um, for about 23 years. I go probably about five times a week or so. I always love to be tan. I love the feeling, the coloring, the, the way I look. It's part of, part of how I envision myself. I, I don't even know my natural skin color anymore because I've been tan for so long. Okay, and you wanted to say what to Peggy? Hey, you're a tanorexic. 
I mean, yes. I, I mean, there's a reasonable amount of sun exposure that probably is good for us, but that much sun exposure is a problem at many different levels. But you know, think of the skin like a cup, right? You fill it up with water, being the sunlight. The right. sun brings you life-sustaining nourishment. It's your ally. When you fill it too far, it begins to overflow. And I think you've reached that limit. Well, after years of excessive tanning, Dr. Oz arranged for Peggy to have her first ever skin cancer screening with Seattle dermatologist, Dr. Brandeth Irwin. Take a look at this. I'm a little apprehensive about what she'll say when she first sees me, um, because I'm probably like a poster child for someone who needs to go to the dermatologist and hasn't. Hi. Hi. I have an appointment. Nice to meet you, I'm nice Brianda. Nice to meet you. It's a pleasure. After taking Peggy's medical history, Dr. Irwin begins a skin cancer examination. She will check literally every centimeter of Peggy's skin, from her scalp to between her toes, looking for abnormal spots. How long has that been there altogether, do you think? Has it been, you know, months or years? That, uh, probably a couple months, I'd say. A couple months? Mm hmm And is it grown at all in that period of time? Mm-hmm. Because it that definitely looks like that needs some attention. I think that we should do a biopsy okay. on today. And is this the one that you mm -hmm. had noticed? And yes. And how long has that been there, do you think? Probably a few years. Okay. Has it changed at all in that time? It's gotten a little bit bigger. Bigger. So I think we definitely should take a look at that one, too. After numbing the areas, Dr. Irwin removes the concerning spots from Peggy's arm and foot. Knowing that she's actually seeing a few things that she that she wants to look a little further into it, um, it's really causing me to wake up and and realize it's not all about the glowing skin. And I kind of go right under the base and take. You okay so far? Yes. Okay, good. The suspicious skin samples will be sent to a lab to see if they contain any cancerous cells. The one on her right arm, I'm looking, thinking that that might be a basal cell or a squamous cell type of skin cancer. We won't know until we see the pathology report. Okay. And then on your foot, that looks like a little mole to me, and I'm just asking the pathologist to make sure that there are no abnormal cells in the mole. And so I think your skin is telling you that it's in distress and right. you're starting to develop, you know, some early changes, possibly skin cancers in your skin. I'm almost beating myself up because there are areas that I've seen for a while and, but yet I just ignored it and uh, didn't think about going to the dermatologist to have it looked at. Well, did you ever think that you might have skin cancer? going to uh, tan as often as you do? Not really. I, I always an envisioned issue. that the person that would get skin cancer would be the light skin, the red hair, freckles. And um, I had more of an olive tone. So I didn't think I was as susceptible to getting it's skin It's a very cancer. pretty olive tone. Why would you want to make it darker? Thank you. Um, That's so interesting. I thought I was olive tone. <laughs> What, what is olive tone? Okay, I thought I was olive tone. Oh, that's priceless. <laughs> no. That's great. I thought that's what I was. But anyway, okay. Do you know the results? What are the results? I I, I know the results. What are the results? Well, the the results are they're both benign. Okay. But, but, yeah. What, 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 what I want to do is take your story because you're lucky they're benign. It's yes. not because you plan it to be yes. that way. And let's save a life. Let's do this, the basics of skin, Skin 101. We're all together on this? Okay, and, and it's simple to do. I'm gonna teach you how to examine yourselves, and here's the fun part. You gotta get completely naked. It's fun to do it in pairs, right? <laughs> nice Chianti, right? And then you gotta get a camera out. And the reason to get the camera out is when you find things, skin things, to take pictures of, <laughs> you gotta snap them with, and put a dime next to or some piece of coinage so you can see how big it was. Okay. And it's the key for us to find out what they are. So here's the ABCs. This okay. is the most common cancer, by the way, skin cancer. Now, the number one cancer is not melanoma of the skin. It's actually called basal cell cancer. It's a cancer that starts at cells at the very base of the skin. That's why it's called basal cell. This is a pretty typical example. Now, before I show you the, the lesion, let me point you out the, the fact that he's got beautiful blue eyes, doesn't he? Right? He's light skinned. Light skin, light eyes means you don't have the kinds of protective elements. These are very uncommon in dark-skinned individuals. Okay. Yet also, these yeah. skin changes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
The, the skin changes, you notice lots of the red little blood vessels there. That's pretty typical from chronic sun damage. But you'll notice the scaly area here. That's a pretty typical appearance of a basal cell. If, if it advances, if you go to the next picture, you'll see that as these get larger, and this is a different person whose, whose basal cells advanced a bit more, you see this little area here that looks like it's pearly? You know, there are pearly gates going to heaven. These are the pearly borders around a basal cell. Classic examples of these. So if you see something that looks like this, they're typically on sun-exposed parts of your body. These are caused by sun exposure. Uh, then you need to take a picture of this and get seen by somebody. The next tumor is called a squamous cell tumor. And these typically start, you, can no, you notice the lips are down here. So this is just <laughs> on the right upper side of the lip. They're sort of scaly early on. But as they advance, go to the next picture, you'll see that they actually pucker the skin in. This is oh. a, a squamous cell cancer of the lower lip. Now, lower lip, why would it be the lower lip? I don't know. Because that's where the sun hits us, right? The sun rays come down from above. That's why it's, now, big question for the whole audience. Extra credit question. Why are most of these cancers on the left side of the body? Driving. Driving. Because the UVA lights go through the glass, the UVB won't, so you don't get the tan all the time, but you can still get the damaging rays. So people who, especially in southern climates, when they're driving, get a lot of sun exposure on the left. Now, melanoma is the big one. Those two cancers, you find this early, you will not die from this usually. We can usually cure folks. But the key with melanomas are the A, B, C, and Ds, right? Here they are real quickly. Asymmetry. Melanomas come from the melanin cells, right? The cells that give you pigment. So they're generally pigmented, but they're often asymmetric. You notice if I drew a line down the middle here, that half and that half don't look the same. That's the A. The B is border. The border's irregular, and it sort of melts into the skin around it. That's a classic sign of a melanoma. That's the B. The C is color, right? This is a sort of an example that I think most folks resonate to. Right? You got every color under the sun in this thing, a little blue, a little green. It melts into the, to the skin in many different ways. So color's number three. And the fourth is diameter, D. You want the, 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 the mold to be larger than about a quarter of an inch before you panic over it. Now, that's about the size of an eraser head of a pencil. So if you can cover over the mold with an eraser head, then you're probably going to be OK. But if you've got hundreds of moles, or a family history, or you've had a melanoma in the past, you need to be screened pretty aggressively. And do people die from melanoma? Melanomas kill people. And they kill people because by the time we find them, they're often beginning to spread. So you have to identify them early on. The basal cell and squamous cell, which is the vast majority, we can cure. So someone is going to save their life today, I hope, by going home and getting your whole body examined. Uh, and the other thing is, if you've seen a dermatologist, that's not enough. Because if you went to a dermatologist for this little thing right up here, and they didn't strip you naked and look at your whole body, yeah. you haven't been screened. Coming up, why Dr. Oz says Peggy's not out of the woods yet. We'll be right back. <laughs> so Dr. Oz is here with a big wake-up call for any of you out there who won't go to the doctor. We just met Peggy, 43-year-old, self-described serial tanner, who had her first appointment with a dermatologist just last week. Luckily, her test came back negative for skin cancer. So could she still be in danger, though? She, yeah. You are still in danger, and, you, and you'll remain in danger, especially if you're not more careful about the sun. So right. the kinds of things we've been talking about with exams uh, frequently on yourself are critically important. By the way, you have a little bit of scaliness in your skin, and omega-3 fatty acids sometimes can help with that. OK. Uh, but other than that, the, the, the game plan is pretty clear. The question is, will you do it? I, I will do it. I want to know, though, can I turn it around? Can I, can I get my healthy skin back? Absolutely, you can turn it around. The beauty of the skin is that you have cells at the base of it that continually replenish it. OK. Not only to make it look younger, but to defend it. This has okay. got to help a little bit. OK. Is it true you, you, you replenish all your skin in seven years? Yes, you, your whole body. Your whole body. Your whole body is a different body in seven years. Your bones, that's why osteoporosis. Yeah. And, and ailments that folks think they're, they're destined to die from or suffer from is not true. You actually can replenish all of your organs. Some do it faster than others. The skin's pretty good at replenishing itself. So to make sure that Peggy understands the damage that she's doing, and it's more importantly, all of you who are watching, Dr. Oz wants her to meet Jennifer. Meet Jennifer, everybody. My name is Jennifer Tomato, and I'm 40 years old. I was a sun worshiper ever since I was a teen. I went to the beach every chance I got. I used baby oil instead of sunscreen. I loved when I got sunburned because I knew I'd be tan in a few days. Being tan made me feel beautiful, confident, and healthy. Well, this is what Jennifer looked like one year ago. And uh, this is what Jennifer looked like after surgery to remove a melanoma from her cheek. So Jennifer's here. Come on up, Jennifer. Oh, <laughs> Come on up. Wow. What do you want to say to Peggy? Hi, welcome. 
Nice to meet you. Yeah, have a seat here. Peggy. Hi. I was just like you. I'm paying the price now. You have to respect yourself enough to stop. And your family and your friends. I was really lucky my melanoma didn't spread. Doesn't mean that in two years it won't be everywhere. I have to live with that every life, every single day. Just because I wanted a tan. And it's just not worth it. It is just not worth it. You do not need to do this to yourself. You're beautiful. You do not need to be tan. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you both. We'll be right back. We'll be right back. Coming up, she refused to go to the doctor, even though her family has begged her. Next, how Dr. Oz got this woman to finally face her fears. As many of you know, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. According to the American Cancer Society, 178,000 women will be newly diagnosed with breast cancer this year. Sandra from Effort, Pennsylvania, is terrified that she will be one of them. Take a look. My mother was probably the most dedicated, devoted mother in the world. She was really kind, she was good-hearted, until breast cancer took her life when I was 16 years old. When she got sick, uh, it just took the whole life out of the house. Nothing was the same, and um, n none of us were the same. Even though Sandra is 43, the same age her mother was when she had breast cancer, she has never had a mammogram. What I'm doing is completely wrong, and I'm, I'm very ignorant, and I'm very surprised at myself, but I just don't want to know. I've never been checked, and it, and it could be something. What happens if they do find something? But tomorrow, Sandra is taking a big step. For the first time in my life, I'm very, very sorry to admit that, I am going to get a mammogram. Sandra's sister, Josephine, pays a surprise <gasps> visit to lend moral support. <laughs> How are you? And to make sure Sandra keeps her appointment. It's something she's been urging her to do for years. I sent her emails. I Would sent her cards. That? There was a special card they made yeah. one year. You know, to remind someone you love to go and have an exam. I just ripped it and sent it. I get every year I get that, um, you know, go get your mammy's grammed or whatever, and I just laugh and I delete it. And you know, I mean, I don't even do a self check. No. I don't. I just they're off limits. I can understand her being nervous, but um, but that doesn't mean she shouldn't go. You know, I am nervous, and I'm afraid that they will find something, and you know, then what? I'm going. I can't back out now, and I'm going to go, and, and I'll just see what happens. Um, I'm not going to like it, but I'll go. So, finally ready to face her fear, Sandra agrees to let cameras follow her as Dr. Oz takes her to get her first mammogram at 43. You look like a deer with the I headlights. I do. I feel like a deer. <laughs> How are you? Hi, it's Come on nice up. to meet you. you know? uh, <laughs> I do. I, I'm so happy you're doing this. All right, let's do it. Let's All right. Do it. Okay. <laughs> so you don't like doctors' offices, do you? No, I don't. Dr. Oz takes Sandra to meet his colleague, Dr. Kathy Ann Joseph, a breast surgeon at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia. It's Kathy Ann Joseph. Okay. Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you. Let me slide it here. Okay, I'm, I'm going to put, put you in the hot seat here. Okay. You should be congratulated for coming in today. I'm a breast surgeon. I see dozens of women come in every day into my office, and they're just like you. So you're not alone. It's just ridiculous that I haven't gone. I mean, all these years, I've just been, I've been worried. And I can't live with that worry to think that there's something wrong. So for, for 30 years, yeah. I suspect it's occasionally come to you that, that you might actually have breast cancer. Yes. So I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring you into the exam room. I'm going to have you change from the waist up so I can examine you and do a breast exam. Okay. okay. All right. Go get them, Tigers. All right. So, Sandra, I'm going to okay. ask if you can just take your gown off. Okay. Just slip it off your shoulders. Okay. Dr. Joseph begins by examining Sandra's breasts, 
for any irregularities. Okay, and now what I'm gonna have you do is lie back. Okay. I'm checking all parts of the breast, and we sort of divide the breast into what we call quadrants. Um, divide it like a clock and four into fourths, okay? Okay, ma'am. You're all set. Okay. okay. Your exam was fine. Okay. I didn't feel anything okay. abnormal. Your lymph nodes were clear. I didn't feel any lumps. Okay. All right. Good. Very good. All right. Okay. So I'm going to have you put your gown back on, and then what we're going to do is I'm going to walk you over to mammography, and we're going to get you that mammogram. Okay. Okay? All right. All righty. You. Hold your breath. Don't breathe. Relax. See, he's telling me to relax. I relax. How often do you have folks who have nothing at all in their physical examination that have abnormal mammograms? Oh, all the time. Sixty-eight percent of cancers are found with a mammogram. Yeah. Out of a hundred. Is that about right? Sixty-eight yeah. of those will be found with a mammogram. Wow. How'd you like that mammogram machine? Oh, I should have went a long time ago uh, instead of bringing fifty million people with me. Yes. <laughs> Wow. And so, results? It's normal. Oh. It's normal. The, the story is much bigger than the fact that it's normal. In, especially in mammography, the, the most beautiful part of the whole story is you have a baseline. Right. This is true, by the way, for a lot of these tests. Mm -hmm. If we know what your unique look is in your breasts, then we actually know five years down the road that that new thing we're seeing is different from what it used right, to be. Right. There was one area in your mammography, by the way, that was, it looked a little different to us. And after a lot of examination, we realized it was completely normal. It's just how you're built. Right. And we're all unique like that. To have that baseline study is critically important. And by the way, I think, I mean, the reason I love meeting you is I can <laughs> see you at age 13 with those beautiful eyes of yours, seeing your mom go off to get a test, a screening test, and coming back with cancer. And dying. Yeah. And so the question is, well, why would you want to go catch that? And that's what a lot of people are carrying around with themselves. The belief that the test itself is going to be irrelevant or in some way be linked up with this whole process that gets you into the doctor's office, then you never come out again. Right. The same. The main focus of all of these shows from me, Oprah, is to make it clear as I can to everybody out there that you've got to be the driver of your ship. You've got to be the world expert in your body. Not knowing if you've got the problem is not going to make it any better, and it actually makes it more difficult for us to That's help. Right. That's right. Don't you feel better now? No, I do. I feel a lot better. It's like a kind of a relief. I don't know why I didn't go. I, I was scared. Yeah. Well, I know why you were scared. I'd be scared too. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I watched a woman, you know, deteriorate in front of my eyes, and I just didn't want to do that to my children. Yeah. Yeah. But if you had, you know, God forbid, had the cancer you still would deteriorate. So it's, it's, I'm always curious as to why people say they don't want to know. Obviously, you've heard that before. Women say they don't want to know. Well, I think um, in Sandra's case, she watched her mother die, and she was at a young, you were at a young age when your mother passed away. And I, what you, you need to understand, too, is we don't know what, what her mother, what stage her mother was at when she was diagnosed. And the thing is, we have, um, we have so much more technology now. Yeah. And so knowledge is power. So if you get that mammogram and you get diagnosed earlier, then you can cure it earlier. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. We'll be right back. <laughs> this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, and so much attention, so much, this is what's so fascinating, so much attention is focused on breast cancer. And it has uh, taken the lives of, you know, a lot of women, but still heart disease is the number one cause of death for women. Heart disease is still number one, but, but breast cancer, yeah. It's spreading around the world now. Yeah. Countries that didn't used to have a lot of breast cancer are starting to see it more and more, and we're starting to see it in, in young women as well. But aren't there more people surviving breast cancer now than yeah. ever before? There are. Let me, let me, I have an animation, if I okay. can show that, because I think okay. it helps explain why. Okay. And this is why finding it early is so important. So your breast is made up of lobes, right? These yeah. little lobes are about 15 or 20 of them in an average breast, and they have lobules in them. The lobules make the milk that feeds and nourishes the child. And the, the milk goes from the lobule to the nipple via these ducts. Those ducts become the roads that are so important in transferring the milk, but they also can be the source of cancer. In fact, 85% of all breast cancer happens in those ducts. But here's the good news. If you look inside the duct, when the cancer's first beginning to start, it stays there for a while. It doesn't break through these walls like that. It takes a while to do that. If you can find the cancer when it's early, you can take it out, and it's done. 
If, however, you wait a bit and it gets through those walls, or it's a bad kind of a cancer, which is more aggressive, it gets into that vascular supply, it gets into the lymph, which is this green that I drew. The lymph is important for the immune system. It drains the, 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 the baggage from the breast, and it goes up to these nodes, which are sort of like peas. You know, they, they're big, and they, they can collect the lymph, but they can also collect the cancer cells if they slip past that border. And as they go into the lymph nodes, we begin to examine and see them there. We see them in the axilla, just above the clavicle. We can even get them inside the chest, which is why doctors always examine you under your arm and above the clavicle to look for them. So the key is to get that cancer before it penetrates through the wall. If you find it then, Sandra, it's done deal. It's a done deal. And that's whether it's in your breast or in your colon or wherever. We're, get it before it penetrates through the wall. You, you have a baseline defense system, an immune system. You want to help it, but it can only defend you for so long. Coming up the intervention that saved this man's life. More with Dr. Oz and interventions when we come back. People who are scared to go to the doctor are going with Dr. Oz. <laughs> so Karen Kane wrote to us last year because she was worried about her husband, Jason. After I watched the Dr. Oz show, I realized that Jason's health is in danger. <laughs> It sounds like he's gasping, like he's actually not breathing for a couple seconds at a time. And I can't imagine what that might be doing to his heart. Eat a lot of candy at night, trying to keep awake uh, 14 hours at a time. Dr. Oz says that the dangerous fat that you're looking at is, is in your midsection, and that's where Jason is his heaviest. I don't want to lose my husband. He's 35. But I know if people keep eating like this, they're not going to be around a long time, you know. I feel like a 45, 50-year-old man in a 30-year-old body. So Jason told us that he wasn't a diabetic, he wasn't hypertensive, he was doing OK, despite the fact he had extra weight on. Well, your test results this morning show that you're a diabetic. I mean, you're 35 years old and you're diabetic. And your blood pressure was 149 over 72. So you're hypertensive. These aren't borderline things. You're actually there. And you know, Karen's too beautiful a woman, and you're just too darn smart to, to let this weight problem become the end of your life, because that's exactly what will happen. Well, that was 11 months ago. Jason has now lost 70 pounds. Jason, stand up. <laughs> we'll talk to Jason when we come back. We'll be right back. Coming up, it was supposed to be a simple surgery. What doctors found in Jason that probably saved his life. We'll be back in a moment. So Dr. Oz gave Jason Kane an instant studio uh, intervention 11 months ago. Now he's back 70 pounds lighter and looking better than ever. How much more weight do you want to lose? Oh, about 50 or 60 more pounds. About 50 or 60. Mm -hmm. But no, tell us what happened with the changes in your life thus far. Well, basically, I, I read Dr. Oz's book, mm -hmm. and I, I learned. You want a diet, yes. Well, I didn't even want to call it a diet. I learned how to self-educate myself on how to eat properly. Because mm -hmm. you didn't know how to eat properly? Well, you, you know, were... everybody knows you shouldn't you know, eat the fast food and the candy. But um, what I did know was, like, bread. I switched to whole wheat. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of things like that just, you know, helps your metabolism speed up. And mm -hmm. uh, instead of candy at night, I eat fruit. I have more energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't Can care. I give you one other bit of news? What scared me when I looked up at you was the fact that you were a diabetic and that you were hypertensive. Yeah. The, 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 your weight was a secondary. And you know what? You're not a diabetic anymore, mm -hmm. and you're not hypertensive anymore. Today's mm -hmm. test showed that. The big story is these are reversible diseases. And I just want to shout out to Karen, because that's the woman who saved your life. That's the woman who made it happen. Wow. <laughs> I think I had one, one last little thing. You, you know, he had that snoring problem. You may have noticed that. Yes. Oprah, did you notice that snoring uh, problem? A little bit. So, <laughs> so we, we, he actually, with the loss of the weight, lost a lot of the sleep apnea. But he still had a lot of the snoring. So Dr. Josephson took out some of the tissue and found a tumor, a cancer. Really? So again, we don't often look in there for cancers, but when you find them early, what'd you do? Well, we uh, straightened out his septum. We gave him some more breathing room, so his sleep apnea went away. And we found the tumor in his palate. We thought it was really nothing, a cyst. And we took it out. It turned out to be cancer. 
the, what, yet again, this, this is the kind of stuff we're talking about. You can change your health destiny. Yeah. Those are not pretty cancers when they grow. So congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Jason Thank you. and Karen. All the best. If you or someone you love is afraid to go to the doctor, we hope this show has at least inspired you a little bit to make a change and to really understand that you can take control of your health, and taking control of your health is taking control of your life. Bye, everybody. Bye.